Hey, what's up, guys? It's Coach Mack, playfastfootball.blogspot.com. Today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, attacking good defenses. All right, And uh, what we're going to talk about is, is how you can try to take advantage of good defenses by using things that they are taught to your advantage. All right, Sometimes, you know, when you're in high school football, like I've been the last 20 years, you know, you have weeks where there's, there's times where you play some defenses that are really sound, really structured, um, and, and coaches do a really good job teaching them techniques and fundamentals. So when you're watching film and game playing, you kind of understand what they are going to do based on what you are going to try and do. And when you're playing teams like that, that to me is always a little bit more advantageous outside of, of the talent level of the two teams. If the talent level is somewhat even, I'd much rather play a solid sound defense than I would play um, a defense maybe that's unsound that comes at you from different angles or leaves guys uncovered or, or guys maybe get up the field a little bit too much. Um, I would rather game plan against a team that I know when I line up in certain things, this is what they're going to be in, this is how their D linemen play, this is how their linebackers play, this is what they're doing in the secondary because I know when I'm playing those teams, even though they're well coached and they're disciplined and they're solid fundamentally, I know that for me, there are certain things that I can do that is going to stimulate a response from those players in certain down and distance scenarios and certain fronts or certain coverages. When you're playing the teams that are unsound, you know, there's a lot of times you have a chance to maybe have some big, some big days or, you know, big yardage gains on offense, but there's some times where you really don't know going in if your game plan is good or not because you really don't know what they're going to do. You know, one week they're one front, the next week they're a different front. One week they're man pressures, the next week they're pressuring and leaving guys uncovered. I'd much rather play the defense where I know going in, I've looked at the film to say, okay, this is what they like to do to two by two. These are going to be their two or three three by one checks. These are their field pressures. These are their boundary pressures. Uh, this is what they do inside the red zone. This is what they do when they have me backed up. This is what they do in sudden change scenarios. I want to know exactly what I'm dealing with so that I can structure what I want to do in my game plan against that. Okay, so, you know, one of the first things you want to look at is playing good teams that are going to have their D-line block down, step down, squeeze, spill, wrong arm, all right? 90% of the good defenses you see out there today are going to be spill wrong arm teams. They're going to make the ball go to the outside. They're going to try and create vertical running lanes. All right, so one of the things you need to understand with that is when you're coming up with a game plan is if they're a very good block rec team and they have a good D-line coach and they have good defensive line, all right, when you want to get the ball to the perimeter on a team like that, you're probably going to be better off leaving their defensive ends unblocked. All right, so if I'm going into a game where I know I'm playing against a good defensive team with really good defensive coaches that are extremely well coached, and I know that they're going to be a block down, step down team, all right, and I know that they're going to squeeze the air out of all those down blocks, and I know that they are going to try and spill and wrong arm, what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and get to the ball to the perimeter, all right, by using schemes that are going to make that defensive end step down, block down. When I block down inside via release, get that kid to squeeze the air out of that down block so I can get the ball to the perimeter. All right, so if we were if we were playing a team that was a good squeeze team, all right, with their defensive lineman, all right, if I want to get to the ball to the perimeter, one of the first things that I'm going to do is I am going to run either jet sweeps or power reads. I'm going to run some type of theories, all right, if they're going to be a too high team, let's say, for argument's sake. I am going to run some type of theories that are going to stimulate the defensive end to squeeze down inside so that I can get the ball to the perimeter. What I'm not going to do, okay, is I'm not going to try and use an outside zone theory to get the ball to the perimeter, okay. I am going to try and use a, uh, a bash or a, a flash or dash, whatever guys want to, you know, the fancy terms guys use. I'm going to use a front side replay tagged with a jet sweep is, one, is going to be one of the first things I'm going to do. So I'm going to take my jet sweep, I'm going to block inside zone or veer away from the jet sweep, all right, and I am going to leave that end on block, hoping that he's a block down, step down guy. When he squeezes down, that's how we're going to get the ball to the perimeter. So we're going to block inside zone away. 
We're gonna leave that end unblocked. We're gonna bring jet motion, okay? And we're gonna run power read, which is gonna give us three helmets on the front side. So we've got corner safety, and, and for us, we're gonna block corner down safety, and we're gonna block the mic if the mic is gonna be a, a run-through guy or, a, or a, a guy that's gonna get over the top. We're gonna always make sure we take that first before we just go ahead and get to the free safety. I'm, if anybody's going to be unblocked in this scenario, it's going to be the free safety that's going to have to come up and make plays in space. Then we're going to have to hold him with play action passes or, or other concepts. So if I know that this end is going to squeeze off of, okay, if he's going to squeeze off of the down block inside veer release here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give him that release. I'm going to play to the strengths of that good defense. All right, I'm not going to fight and, and against that good defense. I'm going to play to his strength, so I'm going to give him a down block. I'm going to give him an inside block. I'm going to make him squeeze. Now when he squeezes, I'm going to pair that with an outside run, All right, which would either be jet sweep with inside zone blocked away, and we would read that five technique. All right, We may just run straight jet sweep that way and give it and hope that it's blocked down, step down, and hope that they don't have something on where that kid's a jet player coming up the field. All right, a read scheme is a little bit better because you can always hopefully be right based on what that kid does. But there's weeks where we'll go into games. If I know that other team is a good base defense that doesn't pressure a lot, or I know what my down and distances are, I'll run the jet sweep without touching that defensive end. And you're starting to see that more in college, whether it be shotgun or under center, teams are going ahead and blocking some type of inside, you know, veer zone scheme, leaving the end unblocked and either handing the jet or front flipping, shoveling the jet, the guy's leaving that guy unblocked without reading it. All right, I like a, a read theory, a power read theory, or a read theory off of inside zone because I feel like my quarterback can make a good decision. All right, but there are a lot of times, I've done it before and I see it a lot in college where they run the jet, no read, because they're either shoveling it forward or they're under center turning and handling. All right, Auburn did it to Arkansas on the very first play of the game for an 80-yard touchdown. They shifted to a formation that might have been a little bit exotic, but at the end of the the end of the day, they took, ended up taking a receiver, jet motion, under center, turned and handed it to him, left the defensive end on block. That end took two steps inside to squeeze the air out of that down block. Ball was on the perimeter. They got one or two perimeter blocks, hit for an 80-yard touchdown first play of the game. All right, so it's definitely not being read when you're under center, and it's definitely not being read when guys are shoveling it forward. All right, so what you're doing is you're attacking that defense by giving the defensive end what he wants. All right? You know he's a good player. You know he's a squeeze player. So go ahead and let him squeeze. Now when he squeezes, use things against him. All right. The next thing you can do, okay, versus teams that like to block down, step down, that like to spill, that like to wrong arm. All right. Is if you're a two back team, you can run old fashioned buck sweep. Okay. So if you're a two back team, you can put yourself in a two back set, and you can run just old fashioned, similar to wing T. Buck sweep, where now, now you're going to down block the three technique on that side, so you're going to give that end a chance, all right, you're going to give him a chance now to block down, step down, squeeze the air out, all right, wrong arm, spill, you're going to give him a chance to do all those things, okay, you're going to take this slot and crack the mic, he's really the tight end or the wing in a wing T set, you're going to push crack out here, depending on who you think the support player is, okay, you're going to take this play side guard and use him as a kick player. Center's going to block back. Back side guard's going to pull wrap. You're going to hinge the back side of it here, okay. Now you're going to take this sniffer and he's going to log that defensive end, all right. You're going to run the buck sweep to the perimeter, all right. If you want to, you can tag an access throw back here so that if it's not an eight man front and it's a, you know, a, a look where. Eight-man front, backer walked in, outside backer, force player walked in, giving you a throw, go ahead and take it, okay? You get a too high structure, you should probably stay, all right? If that weak safety's back here, you should probably stay, all right, with your run game, all right? But you could also, you could have fade, or you could have, uh, if you had press coverage, you could have fade, you could have access built in on the backside. I like to always have an access throw built in on the backside of my runs so that if I'm playing at a really fast tempo, and I call that play what some people would say, quote unquote, blind. In other words, I don't know what the defense is in. I've already called the play and I want to snap it in 13, 12 seconds. I always like to have an access throw tied into the run game so I don't feel like I'm 
quote unquote blind calling place. Because I haven't seen the defense. I think I know what I'm going to get based on what I've studied all week, but I haven't seen the defense. So technically, I have kind of called the play blind, put an access throw in, all right, and now you've got yourself a chance to get out of a bad play. Okay? But what you're doing is you're, you're, you're telling this defensive end, go ahead and play your technique, be a hard guy that's going to block down, step down, squeeze, any veer inside releases. Be that guy that wants to come down in here to spill, especially with a fullback sniffer on your side. Okay? Be that guy that wants to spill. So now that when you go to hard spill, you get logged and the ball's on the perimeter. Okay? So you're taking advantage of that defensive end and that defensive technique when they're well coached off of down blocks, all right, where that guy you know he's going to squeeze. Now you can get the ball to the perimeter with either jet sweeps or you can get the ball to the perimeter with buck sweep, all right? A little bit easier than getting the ball to the perimeter, all right, with a traditional outside zone theory. Now, if you were an outside zone team, and there's a lot of really good ones out there, what would end up happening is more often than not versus good defenses, okay, the stretch play would end up going back underneath, all right? It would end up going back underneath versus good defenses that, that, that are going to block rec. And the reason for that is now when you give, you know, what you have to understand is when you give that, if you're playing a good football team, you have to understand the response you're going to get from the stimulus that you give to that football team. All right? So, again, I enjoy playing good football teams that are well coached because if I know what the response is, I can build my plays that way. All right? So, first two plays we talked about, we talked about getting the ball to the perimeter. If you run outside zone, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a perimeter run. Okay? Your outside zone play, a lot of times, has a chance to go back up underneath, okay, depending on what the defense is, is doing and how they're playing. If they're going to run your outside zone blocks, okay, if they're going to run those blocks to the sideline, the ball's not going to get to the perimeter. The ball's going to go back up underneath. Okay? So when you run your outside zone theories against teams like that, you have to understand when you give this kid a stretch block and you give this three technique a stretch block, if they're really good football players on a really good defense, they're going to start to beat those stretch reach blocks. Now, if they're a bad defense and you can hook those players, then that's great. You'd want to stay with outside zone, okay, or... You know, whatever your version of outside zone or stretch is, I know some people think it's, you know, technically two different theories. For argument's sake, I'm talking about full stretch blocking, all right, where you're trying to stretch the defender, and if he doesn't allow you to stretch him on your third or fourth step, third step in the ground, you're going to throw your hand in the armpit and run him to the sideline, and the back is going to have to read that. All right, I'm not talking about a play that is designed to circle the wagons and go to the brim. So when you go to stretch this whole thing now, if those guys won't allow you to reach them because they're a good defense, and you have to understand that that week when you run the stretch play, all right, when you go to run outside zone play, all right, if you're going to use this guy as possibly a search three defender or you're going to use him as the apex and send him up and up, and then maybe you have access built back here, that week when you're getting ready to run your outside zone play, there's a good chance that your outside zone play is going to end up Okay, in one of those two alleys behind the five and the three technique. Why? Because a good defense is going to run all those blocks to the sideline. And that's what makes outside zone such a great football play. It's good against bad defenses and it's good against good defenses. Because now these backside players have to be really disciplined to, not, to be able to tempo the hip of the football and not get over the front hip of the ball carrier so that the ball goes behind them. Which is good football because now you've slowed down those two players because they can't run out of there on outside zone because it may get knifed up behind them, now you slow them down a little bit. So either way, whether you're trying to get the ball to the perimeter with a five technique that squeezes, logging a five technique that squeezes, okay, or running outside zone and getting cutbacks versus a team that runs and beats reach blocks, okay, what, what you're going to get is you're going to find a way to attack a defense based on how that defense plays its structure. And again, the better they are, the easier it is to find ways to attack. If they're talent-wise much better than you, then it won't matter how you attack because the gyms will beat the Joes all day. 
But as far as a game plan is concerned, I'd much rather attack that structure of a defense. I'd much rather know exactly the response I'm going to get from the defenders because then I know the stimulus that I want to give them to give me that response, and then I want to call plays off that. All right? When you're playing teams, all right, if you're a two-back team and you're playing these types of defenses, it's going to be very tough to get the traditional power counterplay against these type defenses because they're not going to give you vertical running lanes. Okay? They're not going to give you vertical running lanes because when you get the hard double team here to the will, all right, back block, hinge, pull wrap, what's going to happen is on this kick out block, this defensive end, okay, a lot of times is going to try and get under there and wrong on that. So we've already drawn up the buck sweep. Now the power may become more of a of a of a outside run where you're going to tell that backside guard, hey, this week we're playing a spill team. He's going to spill that fullback. We've got to get around that log block every time. Tell the tailback the power might have to bounce. Or you come back and you run a pin and pull theory or you run a buck sweep. But you're probably not going to get vertical running lanes on power counter, all right, on regular gap schemes versus teams that are hard wrong arm spill uh, teams. Now, you may have to throw a tight end in there. You can do some other things. Anybody that's watched Stuff I've done in the past, I don't play with a tight end. I'm not throwing a tight end in there. So what I would do, all right, is if I couldn't have any success that week with the power play, then what I would do is I would make most of my inside runs some type of uh, some type of zone lead theories. Okay, so I would make them ISO theories to where I would go for us. An isolation play is just an inside zone play. All right, for us. We would go inside zone with the same rules and the center ID, the same front. We would lock the backside one and two. So our guard would lock on number one on the line of scrimmage. Our tackle would lock on two. I would take my fullback and I would ice him on the weak side inside linebacker. All right. I would then take my tailback, whether it's pistol or offset, and I would run inside zone front side with the isolation backside. Why? Because I don't think I'm going to get a ton of inside vertical running lanes versus teams that are hard, wrong arm spill teams. We got into an issue a couple of years ago where every scheme we had just about was a scheme that was off of a gap or a veer scheme that left a five technique unblocked 90% of the time. And we were 9-1, and one, we averaged 42 points a game, we averaged 480 yards on offense, and we got to the playoffs and we lost 38-26, to 26. and one of the reasons... You know, I feel that we didn't uh, score even more points in that game. Is the team we were playing was extremely well coached, and when when they got those veer schemes and and down block schemes, they did a great job of spilling the ball, making it go to the perimeter, and then they beat us on the perimeter. All right, I didn't have any answers back then to go back inside and lock up the five techniques and run more isolation style plays or more plays where I was blocking the five techniques. All right, we were in a scheme that we had a lot of success with, but we always left the five techniques on block. So now when I'm playing good football teams, I would rather go zone, ISO, insert, knowing, okay, that I've got a better chance to get vertical run lanes with, with that scheme than I do with a power counter, simply because I know that power counter, they're going to wrong arm and spill. So I would rather run a zone insert scheme versus teams like that if I wanted the ball up inside. All right. Or I would go to one back and run zone insert or zone lead with my quarterback because I can get them to spread the box and one back sets, give me the box I want, and then run off of there. Okay? All right. Now, the next thing you need to understand, all right, is in the passing game, okay, we'll talk RPOs first and then we'll talk just base passes next. Very quickly, all right, in an RPO theory, when you're playing a good football team, if you are playing a very good football team that is a too high structure, okay, what you have to understand is where you need to put the stress. You need to understand that the schematics of the defense first and then understand how you can stress good players based on what they see. So if I'm going to play a too high defense that I know is extremely well coached, all right, and I know that they are going to try and create a seven-man box even though they're giving me the illusion of a five-man box, all right, first thing I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and RPO the open B-gap side linebacker that has to fit. Why? I'm going to try and use his good coaching against him. All right, so these teams are going to make the ball very tough to run at in one back because anytime 
these kids are going to be coached to understand where they need to fall into and the blocks that they're seeing in front of them. So if I give them a zone scheme, okay, where I lock the four down in the mic and I block out on this defensive end, what's probably going to happen is this defensive end is probably going to set the edge of that out block and this will linebacker is going to fold the open B gap in here. Okay? All right? General basic run fits, all right, out of a, a base two high structure versus two by two. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and take advantage of this kid being a good football player. And I'm going to run some type of route that's going to take advantage of the space that he's leaving because he's such a good player in the run game. Now, when that guy's a wild card and you have no idea, sometimes he drops on inside zone, you know, yeah, you may have a better chance running the ball, but you have a, for me, I have a tougher time calling plays when that guy's a wild card like that because I have no idea what response I'm going to get. When I know that this kid is a darn good football player that's playing for a really good football team where the coaches are coaching run fits, if I know that I can give him an out block by the tackle and an open B gap and I know he's going to have to fold, all right, disregarding stunts and blitzes in games. If I know that I can get that, and that end isn't a two-gap guy where on an out block he crosses the face, if I know that end's going to set the edge of that block and he's going to fold, then I'm going to come back with an RPO. Okay, so what you have to understand is how to attack good defenses and, and understand that I want to make that will pay for being a good football player. All right, I, I want to use his good football against him to the best of my ability. Very similar in the passing game, okay, when you have a team that is a too high structure, okay, when they're a too high structure like this, in the passing game, if they are a too high structure, that's going to be a pattern match or a pattern read team. When you use your tailback and you push him in motion, okay, most of your good too high football teams, okay, most of your good too high football teams are going to push the Mike linebacker, they're not going to rotate the secondary with tailback motion, all right, or with running back motion, all right, so what's going to happen is most of your good teams, they want to get four on three and three on two, okay, so if they're a too high structure and a pattern read, pattern match team, when you push the tailback to get numbers, they're going to push the Mike linebacker. The reason you won't get a lot of secondary rotation is you still have two receivers on the backside. So you're not going to get a lot of hard secondary spins unless it's some type of zone pressure coming. If it's base defense with the tailback motioning, you're not going to get a lot of spins in the secondary. When you'll get spins is when you flat motion across the three by one. Because now that you leave a single back here, they can be two on one. And even if they spin the secondary, they can still have a little bit of a one and a half to two on one scenario on the back. On the back side. If I push my tailback out, to create three receivers. If they spin a secondary down, I still have two receivers on the backside. If he spins and he spins, I'm going to end up with two for two on the backside, and you're not going to see that a bunch versus good defenses. What you're going to see is Mike push a little bit, and you're going to see this Willie push a little bit, okay? And then you may see, you know, this guy's not going to do too much. He may come back in the box. His open gap is the A gap. The tailback leaves, quarterback draws, all you got left, okay? so. What you're going to see is you're going to see some mic push so that they create four on three, three on two. All right, if they're a pattern read, pattern match, two high structure. So that when you're doing that now, what you want to do versus good defenses is you now want to make sure that if you're getting mic push, you want to make sure that you have ram or read away from mic theories in your passing game. Why? Because you want to take advantage of the good linebacker that understands he's got to push the coverage that way because you're going to get three on three, so he makes four on three. So you want to get to a situation where you take that kid and say, hey, they're a great pattern match team. They're a great pattern read team. When I push my tail back, they're going to push their Mike linebacker. Okay, so you want to go with things like three-man scat on the front side, and then you want to go with a level or drive theory on the back side and now when the mic pushes now what you want to do when the mic pushes is you want to get a two on one in an area you feel like you can control so what I want to do now is I want to take advantage when the mic pushes I want to take advantage of this backside apex guy and say if he widens to wall out the vertical I'm gonna throw the five yard fin okay if, he, if the vertical gets by him 
and he sits on the fin, I'm going to throw the ball in this window created by the vacating mic, pushed out. Okay? Another thing you can do is you can throw screens on the backside. So you can run a tunnel to your number one. All right? You can pass set the edges and leave those guys alone. All right? You can take your number two out and get him to the corner to make sure that he can't follow. You can take your wide receiver up and back down and in to run a tunnel screen. Take your front side guard, pass set, and then run him to the sidewalk. Take your center, okay? Pass set, all right? In this instance right here, he would pass set away from, this would be our man side for hot reads. He would set, all right, this A gap, and that guard would set that A gap. He would have any run through blitzes in his front side A gap, so he could set it here. He could help post the one if he needed to, if there's nobody in his A gap, but he could set it here, and then he could get out to run the out, okay? Then your backside guard could set the one, and then he can get out to clean up any trash. So what would happen is, all right, you would have an out block here, all right, and then what you would have is we always try and keep our guys, all right, and then depending on a scenario, we try and say that we've got a sidewalk player, we've got, all right, an alley player, all right, and we've got a rat killer or a wall player on our screen. When we're going to go guard, center guard, we're going to try and go sidewalk, alley, rat killer on the wall. So what would happen here is, since we have this corner going, this uh, number two slot going out to block the corner, all right, this front side guard is probably going to be a guy that's going to end up on the Sam, all right, the center is going to end up, or depending on who shows first, you're going to have the center and the guard for the Sam and the free safety. And then your backside guard, the only thing that should be left, all right, is either you can choose to rat kill him behind the screen since anything that might be trailing, but since it's a tunnel screen being thrown so wide, I would rather get him up here to late wall if the mic responds or somebody else responds back late. Because if it's a read away from mic theory and the mic has pushed, I know that on this side I have numbers because I have one blocker, two blocker, three blocker, and a late fourth blocker, all right? They have one defender, two defender, three defender. I read away from the mic, the mic pushed, so I know I have numbers back there. If the mic doesn't push, I would stay front side and throw the snags, Leary, because I'm going to have numbers here, okay? So in the passing game, whether it be RPOs or simple drop back passes, that's how you can take advantage of good defenses. Let the mic push. He's a good defense, he's, he's well taught, he's a good player, he's a pattern read, pattern match player. His three went out, he knows that the new three has got to come from the outside coming back in, he's going to push to make it four on three, okay? So use that against them. Don't sit there and say, all right, this is a great pattern read, pattern match team, we're not going to be able to throw anything against them. Use that coverage and those techniques. If they're well coached, use it against them. Use their techniques and fundamentals against them because they're well coached, all right? I would much rather always play a well-coached team than, than a Wild Wild West team because you don't know what you're going to get. Now, you may score 50 against that Wild Wild West team, and you may score zero against the well-coached team. But I know going in with my game plan, if the talent pool is even and we do a good job in practice and we play well Friday night, I know that I'm going to have some good ball plays dialed up because I know when I down block what the end's going to do, when I push my tail back what the mic's going to do. Okay, now, what you have to then understand is the chess match becomes... Blitzes, down and distance, stunts, eliminating gaps with front, stunts up front. Can they change the front? You know, can they go odd? Can they, whatever, what's their long yardage package? What's their short yardage package? That's all the auxiliary stuff that makes the game so great. But 75% of the game is going to be played probably in some type of base setting. You're going to have a ton of first down and tens, which are base scenarios. That's where you can dial up good ball plays because you know in your formations what defense you're going to get, and you know when you do certain things what responses you're going to get. So when you're going to attack good defenses, understand the structure of the defense. Give them the stimulus that they want. Understand what the reaction to your stimulus is. Okay? The thing I hate the most or, or the thing that I struggle with the most is anytime you're going to put in some type of new formation or new wrinkle versus a team because now I don't know what I'm going to get. If they're really well coached and I have film on them, I want to stay in the things that I've seen on film because I know what I'm going to get and I can dial up good ball plays. 
Now, if I wrinkle something, whether it be formationally or shift or motion, it's hard for me to tell my kids what they're going to get from the other team because I haven't seen. So I would much rather see a good defensive team, know what they're going to do, how they're going to play, study that film, and then give them the stimulus they want. Don't try and really trick or dick good football teams. Go after good football teams by giving them the stimulus they want and then trying to take advantage of where you can take advantage of the response based on the stimulus you gave them. Okay? If they're blocked down, step down, leave them unblocked and go to the perimeter. If the ends are hard up the field players, then run your power count. All right? If they're a pattern read, pattern match, too high structure, push your tail back out, see how they react, and when they push the mic, read away from the mic. Play against good defenses by using their strengths against them. Okay? That is my opinion. Uh, for me as a coordinator, if I was calling an offense, I'd rather play good defenses than defenses that are all over the map. I feel way better about my game plan. All right? As always, it's going to come down to Jims and Joes more than X's and O's, so talent is a big factor. Understand that you got to block, you got to execute. You can't just draw ball plays now. All right? But understand, more importantly than anything else, you don't play well until you play fast. I'll catch you guys next time.